Oh my goodness, I could not be more excited to announce that today's episode we have a photographer extraordinaire, Monsieur Greg Fink. Yes, the French photographer himself. I'm actually going to take a line straight from his website because I feel like it re represents so much of who Greg is and how he serves. He says, we believe in excellence, diversity, inclusion, and timeless elegance. We are proud to be trusted to create your family heirloom. Greg is the type of person who truly creates heirlooms. He creates valuable connections. What I learned from interviewing Greg is how dedicated, passionate, and powerful he is in creating the business he always dreamed of. Never compromising, always wise. Here's my interview with internationally famous, renowned, brilliant photographer, Greg Fink. We dive into all sorts of questions about how to build a destination wedding business. You're listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Join Darcy for a wild rummage around in her wit and wisdom. She's a photographer, an educator, and a marketing ninja. Each week, she's going to be teaching you all about creating a life full of mindset, money, and marketing miracles. Listen to real-world experiences and surefire strategies from expert guests, all to keep you focused on your path to success. Think less hand-holding or fist bumps. So stop playing safe. It's time to start playing it brave. Here's your host, Darcy Benincosa. Welcome to the podcast, the Play It Brave podcast. We have our very special guest, Greg Fink. Greg, I've admired you for so long. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> admires you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very nice of you to say. Thank you for having me in the podcast. It's a true honor. Well, one, you're a phenomenal photographer. And two, you have a French accent. So that's why all Americans <laughs> are just like, who is this man? How do I learn from him? I love your art, first of all. Like, I know we're going to talk about marketing in this podcast today, but you truly are such a phenomenal photographer, which I always tell people, if you want to be good at photography, you have to become a really good photographer. How did you how did you get started with that? How long have you always shot film? Like, what did that, what did your trajectory? Yeah, and there? first of all, thank you so much for uh, saying that. I really appreciate. Um, so I've been a photographer all my life because I started as a kid. Uh, my dad was passionate about photography, so he taught me. We had a dark room at home. So the first time I remember having a camera in my hands, I was probably 10 or 12. Mm. And I basically spent a lot of time in my dark room between, I will say, 10, 12 to 18 or 20. So I've always had a camera in my hands. It's very difficult for me to explain how I compose my images because it just become, it just be, become kind of natural. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for me to attend family events, friends events without just having a camera and capturing the moments. Mm -hmm. So I just love it. Um, I, I'm not very good with words. I'm not very good with reading. I, I just love expressing my feelings by making photos and making pictures, if it makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So you're a little bit like me where we've just always shot on film. So it exactly. wasn't a process that we later had to learn. I've had to learn how to do digital because <laughs> I'm not very good at it. And you know, you know what? It's funny that you say that because I started with film, but I started shooting weddings on digital because it was just so much easier. Mm -hmm. And I shot my first wedding back in 2010. So it was kind of the beginning of digital. And I was so bad. I mean, I was not happy at all with the result that I got. Mm -hmm. um, ed the editing process just took me so long. Um, and basically, this lasted like five years. And the reason why I came back to film is because I was just not happy of the work I produced on digital. Did you keep shooting your personal work in film or did you start shooting I personal did, work on I digital? I did in the time. I did in the time. I've always shot on film like my family, my friends. Uh, but the wedding was a different animal. So I was like, okay, let's just go with digital so that I'm on the safe side. But I, at the end, I was just not happy with the result that I got. So when I felt comfortable enough uh, on the weddings, that's when I decided to get back to film. 
Yeah, I think you kind of have to. I did the same. I started shooting in wedding. I think I shot my first wedding 2007, but didn't really get into it till 2011. And it, I did start doing digital just because I thought I got to get these things in focus. <laughs> I need to make sure they're exactly. turning out. And you really have to go through that growth of, of learning. So when you like, let's say you show up at an event and you're not photographing it, what kind of camera do you bring? Do you bring like a small one? Do you carry the big one? What kind of gear are you using? If I only have to use one camera, I, I love the contacts. Yeah. And um, everybody around me is very frustrated, especially uh, my girlfriend, because she's buying me, like, for my birthday, these fancy cameras. Like, she offered me, like, an acid light, a beautiful one. But I always end up, like, um, having the contacts in my hands. I just love the look of it. I just love how easy it is to use. So I can honestly shoot 95% of my work just with the contacts and the 18 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to cover a wedding with. Mm -hmm. I, I don't change lenses. If I need to have a wide angle, I'm just going to step back. Mm -hmm. I'm not technical at all. So I just... I don't want to worry about like my camera, my lenses, carrying a bag. So the contact is really the camera of my choice. And if, if I just have to pick one, this is the one I'll go with. And how do you approach your receptions? Do you, do you shoot the contacts at the receptions as well? So during reception, I will um, shoot a couple of like ambient shots on mm -hmm. long exposure of the contacts. And for everything which is related to the pitches, I will go with a Canon Digital. Mm -hmm. um, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> not that I hate it. I don't like it. But, and as of a sudden, you give me a digital camera and I just overshoot. I mean, uh, me too. Up, we sound like the exact same like, person. <laughs> you end up having like 25 images like per minute of a speech. And it's so repetitive when you edit them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is just my process. And I'm very bad with trying to change things. I mean, I kind of like my routine on weddings. Yeah. So I will spend I will spend eighty percent of the day with the contacts, and the twenty percent rest of the day with the um, the Canon and usually an eighty five millimeter lens mm -hmm. or maybe fifty. I'm very bad with shooting with the thirty five. Mm -hmm. Thirty five millimeter. I mean, I respect so much photographers who use 35 millimeter, but to me, just like too many information on mm. one frame. Um, I have a lot of OCDs. Uh, so when there's too much information, I feel cluttered. I feel distracted. So I'd rather have the 50 or the 85 and focus on one object, the next one, the third one, instead of trying to tell a story with everything in the same frame. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And you know what is so funny? I have a little OCD and I feel like being a fine art wedding photographer is the best outlet because I take really clean images. Mm -hmm. I make sure that they're all crafted. I, it's like exactly. it's like the happy place for me when I can really craft that. And I do the same with the contacts. It's so perfect. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. And I will spend like tons of time like making sure that the horizons are straight and everything. Me too. I, just love it. Me too. <laughs> I once even bought a level for my camera so I could see how how like how straight it was. I, I was like, that is overkill, Darcy. You need to just... Yeah, we're the same. We're the same. <laughs> but okay, so when you started shooting weddings, do you remember... Like, like what happened to put you, cause we all sort of start the same. We just start shooting people, you know, that have maybe cheaper weddings. And I feel like the trajectory. And then one day you get this big break where you get this wedding mm -hmm. and you're like, oh my gosh, this is it. I'm going to be able to get this wedding out there and it's going to show a whole new level of my work. Did you have anything like that happen or how did you grow? Yeah, I, I remember like exactly. That? Um, so basically during four years, I shot wedding just for fun and I never planned to go full time because I shot my first wedding 10 years ago, but I've been full time only for five years. Um, so during the first four or five years of my career, it was just for fun. It was next to my day job and it was basically for friends or friends of friends, even though I still shot like 20 weddings a year. Wow. So I shot a lot of 
I shot a lot, of, a lot of weddings next to my day job. I loved it. It gave me a lot of cash money to just like reinvest into like equipment. So I loved it because I always had the best equipment. Uh, but I never planned to go full time at this point. What made a big difference for me was attending a workshop uh, with Feather and Stone Photography. Uh, they are photographers based uh, in mm-hmm. California. Yeah. And they told me, Greg, you have to approach the destination wedding because these are American clients coming to get married in Europe. And they gave me some idea of the budget and I was like, what? <laughs> 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 I, I love some clients like this as well. And that's basically when I decided to really have a strategy to go on a luxury clientele. And that's when I decided to switch back to film. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I invested these four or five years of my life approaching weddings. I'm very comfortable with weddings right now because I know the process. I know how to manage getting ready, portraits, reception, and so, so on. And now I really need to have a strategy to have more crafted images and this was back in 2014 and i remember exactly this very wedding that you're talking about so the inquiry was for french couple but getting married in the south of france where i wanted to get specialized because that's where a lot of destination weddings happen yeah and they got married in this beautiful venue which is called villa et it's this, it's this beautiful pink uh, villa on the french Riviera. And I basically did everything I could to get that wedding. And I ended up booking that wedding for $4,000 and it was a three days coverage. So I was so happy with the budget back in the days. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and five years after, I'm like, really? $4,000 for three days? But this was kind of my defining wedding. And it's been on my portfolio for very long until last year, I think. Um, So I shot this wedding definitely very high hand much better than the weddings that i used to shoot before that and that's when i decided to make the most out of this wedding and one of the first things that i did with it is that i just sent the photos of the wedding to the venue and i was like you know what i will never have a reply from these guys i mean they do so many weddings there it's such a high-end venue there's no way they will send me a reply and So I find the address on uh, their website, I send the gallery, and the next day they're like, oh, thank you so much, Greg. You know what is the first time a photographer actually sends us photo from a Mm. wedding in our venue? Do you Isn't mind? Isn't that if, crazy? That's the that's, first time? Good marketing. Yeah. And you didn't even know. <laughs> no. And you're always like, you know, I'm not going to do it because um, everybody's doing it. And then you yeah. do it and people are like, nobody does it. Mm-hmm. And and the next thing there, do you mind if we include you in our list of preferred supplier? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Of course. I love that. So this was kind of my defining uh, moment and defining wedding back in 2014. I love that. Oh, yeah. I remember mine too. It's just like, I still use pictures from that wedding to this day because it's still just an epically beautiful wedding. It kind of came right when I needed it. So when you did that, so you knew very specifically, so you were shooting for four or five years, which I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that you were kind of shooting digital weddings four or five years. Then you realized, okay, there's a huge opportunity for me here to hit a luxury market, to start shooting film, to get more into the South of France, to raise my prices. And once you did that, did you just um, create like a portfolio and, and start releasing things so that you would get published and found? Or did you just start doing real weddings only? Like, how did that work? Okay, so, so this wedding I'm talking about was in June 2014, which is exactly the time when I quit my job, my, my uh, day job. So I was very sure of where I wanted to go. I was sure of my vision, and my vision was to specialize on American clients getting married in the south of France or Italy mm-hmm. because I realized there was such a big market for this, and the budgets were, were good. Um, I heard about a lot of fine art photographers flying from the States to shoot this wedding. So I was like, okay, why not? Um, And I remember what I did. 
I mean, I already had a website from these past five years and I basically erased everything mm -hmm. because it was not in line with the work that I wanted to put in front of my clients anymore. Mm -hmm. So even though I had an history of probably 80 to 100 weddings, I just decided that I will not show one more photos from this period. And mm -hmm. I started from scratch again. Mm -hmm. And I remember starting with a very, very limited portfolio back in 2014 because the work that I had on film back in the day were, was very limited. And I remember my portfolio probably had six entries and four of them were style shoots. Mm -hmm. So I only had like a couple of real weddings and then style shoots because this is a work that I wanted to present to my clients right now. And there, I really wanted to avoid the confusion with everything that I had before on digital. Mm -hmm. So I just started with a limited portfolio. And um, I think I've always been kind of good with selecting my clients. Mm -hmm. Because as I was already shooting like 20 weddings a year for the past five years, I've always had like many requests, like from word of mouth, I was already published. I was already on Stanley Pretty. So I've always had a lot of requests, but I was like, okay, how can I pick the one that are 100% spot on compared to my vision? Meaning, is it an American client getting married in Provence on the French Riviera in Lake Como on the Amalfi Coast, etc.? So I was very targeted on where I want to shoot and with which type of clientele I want to shoot. That's perfect. Yeah, I think so many people would be afraid to take that big risk of deleting everything. And they think, well, I'll just sort of grow it. But you were like, nope, hard out of that, rebuild this, go from that. And I think one of the things that I've noticed about even your styled shoots is they didn't look like sometimes things look so much like a styled shoot, like you can just look at it and tell it's kind of fake. Yours feel very much like there's still a authenticity to them, if that makes sense. So even when I've looked at things, I'm like, I can't tell if this is a styled shoot or a real couple and it doesn't matter because he's just captured them so, so in alignment with your vision. So that's really awesome. So what do you think if we're going to tell people, because everybody wants your job, <laughs> everybody's like, South of France, French Riviera, American couples, this is my dream. And, you know, what would you tell people about breaking into that luxury business? Because you and I both know it can look easy from the outside and people can think it just sort of naturally happened. But I, I met you at Hybrid Co. I think maybe one or two years ago. And what I knew when I listened to your talk, I was like, okay, he is like me where we're very much setting out a plan, understanding marketing, being smart on how to get our art out there. So do you have any tips, um, like real genuine ideas for people who really, really want this? Yeah, the first one um, I will say is to be specific. I mean, so many photographers right now call this themselves destination photographer. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to be a destination photographer. Everybody wants to travel. I love traveling. This is one of the main reasons why I do the job that I do. Um, but even though I travel anywhere in the world and I've shot weddings in Bali, I've shot weddings in California, I shot weddings in South America, my core business remains the South of France and Italy. Mm -hmm. So very concretely, what it means is that if you go to my website, the home page is going to show you the Eiffel Tower. Because I want to say to my clients, I'm European, that's where I am. If you go to my portfolio, 80% of the entries are going to be South of France and Italy. Mm -hmm. Even though, once again, last year... 2019, I probably shot 50% of my wedding in the States, mm -hmm. which is fine. But my brand is South of France and Italy, because if someday everything disappears and all of a sudden I don't have any more attraction in the States or somewhere else, that's still where I want to be known. That's still where I want to be a key player, South of France or Italy. So what does it mean? Let's say you don't have the attraction to shoot anywhere else. I will invest all of my money to create content 
to do style shoots in the south of France in Italy. Mm-hmm. You want to do a style shoot with me in Normandy, if you're paying me for it, if I have time, I will do it. If not, sorry, it's not part of the plan. So to me, the, the number one thing is to be so specific. And the example that I always give is that I live in Paris. Mm-hmm. I don't shoot in Paris. Mm-hmm. I'm not inspired by Paris. It's raining right now. The light is <laughs> shit all the day. <laughs> and I mean, some American photographers, you first capture Paris so much better than me. I'm just not very inspired by Paris. I'm mm-hmm. inspired by the beautiful light of the south of France, all of these amazing locations in Italy. So that's where I want to be known for. So what does it mean? Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm shooting 20 weddings a year. I'm going to publish five, four of them are going to be South of France and Italy. Mm -hmm. So being very specific for me is one of the keys. And with this destination photography thing, people tend to be too general. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I'm based in Virginia. I'm based in New York. And all of a sudden I want to be famous in the South of France. I mean, if I take my case, one of my favorite locations to shoot is California. Mm-hmm. I mean, the light is absolutely insane. I feel so inspired, everything. But let's face reality. There's no way I'm playing to California every single weekend, like 20 weekends a, a year to shoot weddings. It okay. just won't work. So I can do a couple. I can do one. I can do two. Maybe I can do three a year. But I will never get more than this. And you know what? The other thing is that competition is so fierce in California that, I mean, I'm not even sure I have a right to play there. So it all started with this. Where do I have a market close to where I live? And the sensor is a sauce of France in Italy, which also applies for photographers in other countries in Europe, and I mean, if you live in Germany, you're still only an hour away mm-hmm. from these locations. And then it's, how do you mostly communicate on these areas? If you look at my Instagram, 80% of the photos are going to be shot in these locations. So Indeed, being very things, specific. Yeah, I agree with you. This One of the things that drives me nuts is when I look at a website and they're like, based in Kansas, travel anywhere. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Anywhere doesn't get, you know, mine is very specific, Paris, New York, Park City, Mm because I live, I I live in all of those places and I go there often, multiple times a year. And I just really show those locations. That's where I want to shoot. When they say we'll travel anywhere, it's almost, it just almost doesn't mean anything to me when I look at their website or their portfolio and I don't really see it. It's just too vague. And the other thing is just what you said is that you don't see it. I mean, if you claim that you're shooting in Paris and then you maybe have just like one entry in your portfolio, which is Paris, it just not, I mean, your clients won't believe it. And it's just too vague. And what I always say is that my only job as a wedding photographer is to find 20 clients a year. Yep. 20 clients. So, I mean, of course, if I say I will travel anywhere, it will open the opportunities but I mean, just looking at the salsa friends in Italy, I mean, how many venues, high-end venues can you name in these locations? Probably like 50 venues. Each of them does an average of like 20 weddings a year. That's a pool of like 1,000 weddings. Exactly. Um, in this, uh, and I need 20. Mm-hmm. So I mean, targeting California, New York, Bali, Thailand, you name it. I mean, it's fun once in a while to have one of like these amazing opportunities. I just was in Mexico like a month ago. It was an amazing wedding. But I'm just because it was an amazing wedding, I'm not going to decide to specialize in Mexico because it's going to be just like too difficult for me. Exactly. So being just like specific to me is the key. And when you have decided to be specific, the question is, how do you stand out? How do, how do you different yourself from people who already are on this market? Because if you tell me, okay, Greg, I'd like to enter the market in Tuscany, you know what? You're not going to be the only one. Um, and this is something I kind of work on every day. 
is what I'm doing right now different from what other people do? And um, I run a lot of workshops. I run a lot of one-on-one. -on -one, and the first question I ask to all of my attendees, the very first one is, what is the value that you create mm -hmm. on your market? Mm -hmm. What value do you bring to your market? And people, people usually are, I do pretty good photos and I'm good with people. Yeah, but okay. that's not enough. Mm -hmm. what, what value do you bring? What do you make? differently how do you stand out how will i notice you and say okay this guy has something different and this is a big question and to me this is 80 percent of my job every day when i post something on instagram is it going to be different i I, lo I like the fact that you said my style shoots for some aspects are, are different from the other ones that you see because i am just driven by that is it different if you approach me as a wedding planner and say, okay, Greg, we'd like to do a style shoot with you, I'm going to be, okay, what's the story? Or mm -hmm. well, it's going to be a bride in a lavender field. Sorry, I'm not doing it. We've, <laughs> done, we, we've seen it like we've thousands We've seen it so times. much. And usually the bride looks like she's 18 and she has too much makeup on and the dress doesn't yeah. fit her quite right. And people think, I'll put this style shoot together. And they'd rather do 10 style shoots than one really good one where they get exactly. someone exactly. who really can bring to the camera because it is such a, I think models are the most important thing and finding someone who doesn't look too much like a model, you know, exactly. like that's a thing. And then not putting a ton of makeup on her and having her, you know, when I show up and they look like they're 18, that's just not my ideal client. My ideal client is older. They're in their, and usually they're in their thirties, truthfully, my luxury clients, but. Exactly. And if you look at my own page, my own page is a photo from a campaign that I did for Shome, which is a jewelry brand. But Shome approached me and gave me um, a budget and said, okay, take this money and please organize a style shoot for us that we can use as a campaign for the brand. And I organized these style shoots as if it was my campaign. Mm -hmm. like, okay, which model am I going to pick? Exactly what you say. Is she going to be 30 or is she going to be like 20? Mm -hmm. She's going to be 30. Which hair and makeup? Is she going to be like very strict and classical or is she going to be like more modern and like self-confident? And isn't it funny that photographers will invest like so much time and sometimes money on shooting, as you said, like 10 style shoots a year and will never spend money or time doing a campaign for their brand. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of the brands out there, if you're a um, designer, jewelry designer, if you're like selling clothes, everybody does campaign all the time. Mm -hmm. Campaigns, campaigns, new campaigns, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And as photographers, we always trust the content from others. Like, okay, you know what? I'm going to collaborate on the style shoots and maybe I will be able to pick one nice photo for my own page. No. Just decide to do one style shoot, invest some money on it, and control everything so that this style shoot is 100% in line with the brand that you want to put on the market. And that's what I think is the difference between like OCD people like us is we know exactly what we want to create. And so exactly. when I'm in, and when I'm like, I'm directing every aspect of it, I have a say in every part of it. And I think some people don't know what they want or they don't know how to create it. So they're just like, I'm just going to go to Paris and put somebody in front of an Eiffel mm -hmm. Tower. And then it's going to just look like the million photos in front of the Eiffel mm -hmm. Tower that are out there that aren't going to set them apart. But truthfully the makeup artist the the clothes the model all of that and then really making sure how does it fit into your brand how does it fit into your portfolio yeah i'm a big fan of that so you were talking we were emailing a little bit about this podcast and you said you really is that kind of where you feel like people can really stand out from such a saturated market like do you have other advice you give them so it's really you know i think doing a very a campaign that's very much in line with their brand so that every image is usable. What are your other thoughts about that? I will relate that thought again to creating content. I think that photographers don't create content enough and tend to trust 
a wedding that they're going to shoot and say, okay, what can I use? So how do you shoot like repeatedly, not only things that you are paid for, and the very example that I'm going to give is that I'm lucky enough to be soon married to a bridal designer. So I had lots of opportunities to shoot like models with beautiful dresses, campaigns, etc. It has shaped my eye to a more fashion um, aspect of things. And as of a sudden, uh, people see my work and I am booked by fashion brands to to shoot like fashion and it impacts my eye a lot in the way I shoot weddings now. So as a person, I'm like, okay, you know what the big differentiation that I can bring to the table in terms of my wedding photography is this fashion eye. And as a person, I communicate on the fact that I'm a wedding photographer with a fashion touch. So the first question is, what do you like? I like fashion and I like the idea of mixing wedding and fashion photography because to me it brings something more modern, something less static, something less fine art in the sense where it's just not like uh, shoes, details, and portraits. So to me, it's a big differentiation and it relates to my um, taste in the first instance and also the people that I've met along the way. So right now, fashion is a differentiation for me. Five years ago, it was shooting film. I mean, mm-hmm. for everybody, shooting film at one point has been a differentiation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not anymore because so many people shoot film for very mm-hmm. good reasons. So if shooting film was a differentiation, I'm sorry, but you need to find another now one. You need to innovate. Yeah. In, so my, we- in my very case, being based in France and being able to speak decent English is a differentiation. Mm -hmm. Because I know a lot of photographers based in France and they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, if you don't speak English and you're not able to sustain a conversation with a client over Skype or the phone, it's going to be a problem. So you have to build, you have to build on your strength um, and say, okay, what kind of strengths do you have that I can highlight and push and as of a sudden, it becomes a differentiation. Yeah. Okay. So did everybody hear that? We all just need to marry fashion bridal designers. Exactly. Please do. <laughs> but I agree with you because film was, sorry, that noise is a puppy that is going crazy underneath <laughs> my feet. Um, so yeah, because at first film is a differentiation and then maybe those of us who used to try, I always traveled, but now travel is so accessible. So now everybody's traveling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you do have to find every year. The thing that you did the year before is not going to keep you doing that. I coach so many people and they come to me and they're like, I used to have a thriving business. Now nothing is happening. I don't get any inquiries. And it's like, you never changed. You just did the same thing over and over again, and you never reinvented yourself. So exactly, you're going through phases of reinvention every time. And I think you're also really good with networking because it sounds like you know you like fashion and you're putting yourself into that world to probably photograph people who love fashion. That's going to be another aspect because you're portraying that Mm -hmm. so clearly. Yeah. Reinventing yourself is something really big to me because when I have attendees, they're like, oh, I mean, you're Greg Fink, you will book your next year. And you know what? I have booked 50% of the weddings that I want to shoot in 2020. And I have no clue right now as we speak beginning of January if, I, if I'm going to book the season the way I want to book it. So every year to me is a reinvention and is like, okay, what else can you bring to the table? Um, Oh, you used to do that, but no, you know what? Everybody's doing it, so let's do something else. Mm-hmm. And I just, and it's funny how it kind of like destabilizes people. I mean, yesterday I just announced that my workshop this year is going to be my last one. Mm. And, um, and the reason why I'm, I announced it is, be, is because I've been running workshop for five years. Mm-hmm. I've done a lot of them. And I feel like it's so repetitive that it's not even fun for me anymore. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm going to stop teaching. I'm just saying that maybe I will find something else. 
And it's funny because when you just like break habits, I mean, people got crazy yesterday on my Instagram, like, oh my God, now emojis with tears and everything. <laughs> and I'm like, it's fine, guys. I mean, it's just like part of the process and just reinventing yourself. I mean, my workshop, I'm not saying it's the same every year, but I mean, the core of the workshop is the same. I won't be doing that for 20 years. It's just like boring exactly. at the end. Yeah. So reinventing yourself, bringing like new propositions to the table is part of the differentiation to me. You cannot be, oh, you know what? I just made a great year. I think like I got the recipe and let just like reproduce the recipe the next year. Maybe mm -hmm. it's going to work like two years in a row, but you know what? The next year it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So it's really like nonstop. And you need to keep in mind that the bride is new every year. Yeah. I mean, the bride who's getting married this year, maybe she doesn't even know yet that she's, en she's engaged. So she has no knowledge at all of the market. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can just build on your reputation. I mean, of course, your reputation is going to be important. Your network is going to be important. And I'm lucky enough to have like a big network around me. But every year is a new, um, not struggle, but uh, challenge. I think as a creative, it is, you know, I'm the same. I think people look at the dog. I think people look at, you know, you on Instagram, me on Instagram and think, oh, they must have two years booked out. It's the same for me. I'm 40%. I'm always usually 40 or 50% at this time because the weddings mm -hmm. unfold. I'm reinventing. I redo, you know, I get different marketing strategies happening. I meet new people. It is that, that is kind of the life we choose as exactly. as photographers because it it's rarely the way we want especially if you stay very specific and true to the kind of work you want to create so yeah that's awesome um okay well i feel like i've asked you a lot of the questions i mean i could go on and on like you know how do you get inquiries and all of these things but i feel like you're so clear on the reinvention is there any daily practice like do you meditate? Do you journal? Do you just create a vision in your mind? Like, how do you get to that place where you understand yourself enough to know how you want to reinvent yourself? Oh, it's a tough one. I would love to meditate. Um, I'm a workaholic, so I tend to be, I tend to spend most of my day working especially lately because I've taken another role on top of my photography business. I'm also the general manager of my wife's company, mm. uh, which is a 20 person company. So it's a lot of work as well. And she's growing big. So um, no, what, what I do is that every day when I sit in front of my computer and that's going to be around like 8 a.m. and I won't move until 8 p.m. I know I can identify the three main tasks that I want to do during the day yeah. and that are going to create value to my work. So a task is not going to be answering email. That's not a task that's just like daily business. But I write down and it's easy as I use this like memos on my computer. That, I mean, just like the, the yellow uh, yeah, stickers, those, you know, yeah. so they're on my, they're on my desktop and every day before starting working, I'm like, okay, what are the three big things that I want to do today that are going to create value to my business? Mm. And because I mean, with the current life, we are so much distracted by emails, Instagram messages, Facebook messages, WhatsApp. I mean, the interruption is nonstop. Mm -hmm. It's important for me to always have in sight what I want to produce during the day. And for example, my only communication tool is email. Mm -hmm. I'm very bad with keeping up with Instagram messages because I probably like receive like 20 a day, mm -hmm. 30 a day. And I cannot be on my computer and then on my phone and then on WhatsApp it's going to distract me from what creates value. Exactly. Answering to messages doesn't create value. Editing photos doesn't create value. Thinking about how can I bring value to my clients? How can I shoot maybe better during reception? This is going to create value. So 
I try to be very focused at the beginning of the day on the three big tasks that I want to accomplish. And at the end of the day, I usually look back at it and I'm like, was I good enough on it? Or was I interrupted too much? Mm -hmm. So I'm really struggling and, and fighting against interruption. And I hate phones. Uh, I mean, I, I never take the phones if you call me on my phone. Mm -hmm. I'm very bad with Instagram messages, and I'm so sorry if some of you guys... <laughs> this is a general apology to everyone and who's ever DM'd exactly. Greg. Forgive him. And, he just doesn't look when, at them. <laughs> and when there's an important message on Instagram, I'm, I'm like, do you mind sending me an email on Visa address? Because I am sure that I will not forget you. And mm -hmm. for example, another OCD is for me when I go to bed, my mailbox is empty. Oh, uh, very so good. So if you, if you send me an email, you will always get a reply because this is just the way I work and this is my behavior to keep my head clean and not being distracted by all of the other stuff. Oh my gosh, I need to do that. That's the one thing I'm so bad at is responding to email. I just, it is, you just get so distracted with everything. So I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time. You are such an artist. You are such an inspiration to the entire industry. People I feel are learning so much just by watching you run your business, by how true you stay to yourself, by how much you know your vision, by how smart you are in marketing, all of it is just, uh, it's a true pleasure to watch. I just feel like you are one of those people. I love seeing what you create. I love the energy you put into the world. It's just, it's the best. So I am so honored that you came and let me interview you. I'm sure everybody will be re-listening to this again and again to say, how does Greg do it? <laughs> and we get the inside scoop. Thank you so much, Darcy, for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. You've been listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Love what you heard? Wonderful. You can shout about it in the reviews. I bet you know someone who needs a shot of self-belief. Then don't keep us a secret. If you've missed something crucial, we've got show notes for this and all past episodes over at darcybenincosa.com forward slash play it brave. Thanks for tuning in. But don't forget, the world teaches you to play it safe. Stand up, stand out and start playing it brave.